G'day. And where we are, obviously, everybody knows the country that we're on, don't, don't you? Yes. And what is that? Gadigal. Yes, we're on Gadigal land. And here um, we've got to think too, this is a place where um, it all started to change for, for Aboriginal people. This is the place, you might say, in a sense, is ground zero here. And that where we are, it's important to remember that wherever you go in Australia, there's there's culture everywhere, even though there might be big buildings like that, that's, we can see outside here, culture is everywhere. And it's important to understand and learn about the stories of your local community and to connect with your local community. Because if we're going to have from the heart, then we have to have heart to heart conversations, don't we? And um, honest conversations, we need truth telling. And um, when you think about it, the times we live are very interesting times. We're going through a, a pandemic. Um, it's not going to end soon. I think we need um, reality about that and that it is a difficult time. And that me, I, I was actually just born up the road up here, a um, member of the Stolen Generations, and it took me a while to found my family. I found my family at the Land Council. So um, I happened to be there, uh, my journey back to there and journey back to country. Um, it's so important. And um, when I think, looking at the news at night, I think about um, leadership and I think good leadership is about being honest and taking people with you. And we've seen, I think in the last few years, some very questionable examples of leadership, haven't we, around the world. And they all seem to have bad haircuts. <laughs> it is, humour is important because we are, as Aboriginal people, humour is a very big part of us for our resilience and for, as humans, for coping with the times that we, we live in and for colonisation, invasion. I think it's actually both. Invasion is the first part and colonisation is the ongoing process that is still happening today, right now. And um, it's important that we take a moment to pay respects to not only the wonderful Gadigal people whose land that we're on, but pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners, elders and custodians of the past, present and future. Um, pay respects to your ancestors, because it's important. We at the Land Council want you to learn about Aboriginal culture, history, and you have a responsibility as an Australian to protect our culture and our sites, not only for fellow Australians, but for the world when you think about it, because it is a legacy that needs to be respected and looked after. So let's have a moment of silence um, for that and also your journey here today and the journey in the future. Um, it's good that when um, black fellows, white fellows, yellow fellows all come together and that we do work together for better outcomes. And also pay respects for those we've lost when you think about the period that we're in with, with COVID and that, because um, it's still, you know, um, raging around the world. So a moment of reflection, a moment of um, paying respects. Thanks. Water falls from heaven, lands on our mother earth. It finds its way to the rivers and to the ocean. We have the Hawkesbury, Nepean, George and the Pacific. And these are the aquatic boundaries of your nation. On behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, our elders, our board and our members, we welcome you here tonight. It is very important that we do have those true conversations and honest conversations. Um, it's important you learn the different clans around here. You've got obviously, uh, you've got across over at Palm Beach where there's Garrigal. Uh, you have over across there the suburb of Camarays and then go up the Camarayal clan, um, Parramatta's Barramadigal uh, out there. So um, let's all work together, walk together for a better future and we can achieve great things when we do that. So have a safe journey home to your family and loved ones and um, Let's show the world what we can do when we respect diversity. Um, diversity is very important. Um, Aboriginal people are not all the same, but diversity 
around Australia, gives us an opportunity to understand the world before we step off these shores. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your introduction. And I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which the Chambers is located, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'm delighted to invite two preeminent speakers tonight to uh, help us continue the journey that Michael spoke about towards a process that um, takes, takes it from an acknowledgement that I've just given to something where we can take action and do something positive to make a positive change. The first speaker, I think it's the first speaker. Danny, are you going first? No, yeah. According to the schedule. All right, good. <laughs> the first speaker is Danny Larkin, Dr. Danny Larkin. Uh, uh, and you've seen uh, in the notes about Danny that uh, she's a Vantalong, uh, Carrigan, 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 K. To practice this uh, woman from uh, Grafton in New South Wales and, and a public uh, lawyer and representative of the Senior Dialogue Leadership Group uh, for the Uluru Statement for the Heart. And the Uluru Statement from the Heart, you can't, of course, read it, but uh, there's a reproduction of it, gives you an idea of the uh, presentation of it and the important uh, language in it. Uh, Dr. Lark is also a director of the uh, Higher Degree. Uh, research and Indigenous Law Centre at UNSW, has practical experience there and she lectures there. Uh, following her presentation, and I won't come up and uh, re-announce it, uh, Ms Teela Reid uh, is a prou proud Wiradjuri and Walwan woman, uh, a lawyer and activist born and raised in Gulgandra in Western New South Wales. Uh, she's currently a defence lawyer based in Sydney, as it's, I think that's a criminal defence or defence is in the Department of Defence. Yeah, no, <laughs> Unless they're in the cells of the Newtown Police Station. <laughs> That's the way there's a nice overlap. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Teela was involved in the working group uh, as a leader on, uh, sexual, on the racist power and the constitutional dialogue process that led to the Ulrich State from the Heart. So we have two preeminent speakers, both of their practical experience and I look forward to hearing their contributions and seeing how we can walk together. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name's Dani Larkin and I'm a Bunjalan Kanarakan woman. Um, this evening, I wanna talk about some of my research surrounding our theme topic for tonight's discussion on law and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Much of my research, but even activism as an Aboriginal woman, public lawyer and academic, is focused on achieving political empowerment of my culture and my people. I view Indigenous citizenship and political participation as an offshoot of exercising self-determination rights by Indigenous colonised people. It's a way of not only communicating our wants, needs and aspirations, but also it's a political way of us exercising our sovereignty. And what we've experienced within Australia is a misinterpretation of self-determination rights by the Australian government. In fact, because of that misinterpretation, there have been significant limitations that have been placed upon the way in which we as Indigenous people of Australia choose to exercise and express our rights to self-determination politically. And so from there, this has had, well, it's led to a lack of political participation being exercised by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. And what that's created is a system of governance, lawmaking and politics that's worked to maintain status quo, non-Indigenous-led decision-making about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that is paternalistic and has minimal regard for the need to create a different system where legal and political pluralism can exist between both cultures. So here I'm talking about the need for and with the right progressive leadership attitude and ability for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures to intersect with the overall mainstream governance structure of Australia to make for better informed decision making on Indigenous affairs. And what it would also do is it would ensure that meaningful inclusion, consultation and regard is had by ministers in parliament throughout everyday lawmaking policy and practices um, to ensure that Australia is really aligning itself with its constitutional values that are representative and democratic. However, in order to get there, the main requirement that underpins such changes to a state's governance structure and its political process 
is typically achieved through constitutional reform and that there are legislative requirements present with ensuring prior consent and consultation is sought by a state from its Indigenous people when drafting laws and policies that are later implemented that will go on to impact upon Indigenous people and their cultural affairs. Prior consent and consultation sought after of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by the Australian government must not be limited to lower levels of governance. Rather, it must be sought at all levels, including Australia's Commonwealth level, and the consultation must be meaningful, it must be substantive, and it must be effective and respectful so that it can appropriately counter political majority dominance. Now, the only real way that responsible government politically occurs in Australia in terms of ministers gaining a form of consent from their citizens they represent is through citizens politically participating in Australian elections. Now, this form of consent giving is limited because citizens are reliant on their single vote at an election to hold ministers to account. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, there exist additional barriers direct and indirect, within electoral legislation, particularly at a Commonwealth level, for First Nation people to either vote at an election or to run as a candidate. So, for example, two key barriers Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to contend with in Australian elections is the unsound mind disqualification and the person serving a lengthy term of imprisonment disqualification. And this is because, firstly, there exists entrenched racism within our healthcare sector that has shown that healthcare workers, including doctors, are highly likely to racially discriminate against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so there's issues with the wording of the unsound mind electoral disqualification that places a broad, undefined power with a doctor to determine, first, the mental capacity of someone, and second, indirectly, their eligibility to vote. And I think those two functions are too broad and they serve two different purposes. And so there needs to be a narrower scope for those types of um, deliberations. And the wording has also been critiqued by the Australian Human Rights Commission as being too broad and not reasonably justified according to standards of universal suffrage. There also exists an entrenched racism within our criminal justice system that disproportionately targets Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not only to our detriment and institutionalisation with our high rates that we comprise of in incarceration, but also to the extent of our high numbers we comprise of for black deaths in custody. So what we rely on then is namely institutional representation through our own formed, self-determined and self-governed First Nation representative bodies. Some older national Indigenous representative body examples are the Aborigine, Abor Australian Aborigines League, which was led by William Cooper and formed in 1934. Mm. By 1937, my great-grandfather Jack Patton, William Ferguson and Pearl Gibbs led the Aborigines Progressive Association. They all got extinguished in time. Then there was the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, formed in the late 1950s, the Council for, the Aboriginal, for Aboriginal Affairs, which was formed in 1968, which later then joined with the Office for Aboriginal Affairs to form the Department for Aboriginal Affairs. They all got extinguished eventually. The Department of Aboriginal Affairs lasted for 17 years until it was dissolved and replaced by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. There was also the National Aboriginal um, Cons Consultative Committee, which was formed in 1972, but it held very little weight in terms of its advisory functions. By 1989, the Labor government passed the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act, Commission Act 1989, Commonwealth legislation, which then of course formed the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC. ATSIC was later abolished with bipartisan support in 2005. It's often critiqued by white scholars in a similar way to what Howard stated at the time of its abolishment, which was that the experiment in separate representation, elected representation for Indigenous people has been a failure. But what often gets missed in the analysis of the limitations that were placed on ATSIC is that there were limitations placed by ATSIC by the Australian government, and it was strategic to make it an inadequate vehicle of true self-determination. Instead, 
ATSIC became a mechanism for the government to replace its accountability for its failure to empower Indigenous people. Most of the policy areas termed failures actually fell under the control and oversight of mainstream government departments, particularly with health and education. There's more national bodies that have been created for Indigenous representation within Australia, which I won't get into. But the point of this part of my presentation is this. All of them have been created, extinguished, given the same limited roles, functions, or with zero government accountability and ministerial scrutiny to ensure the cycle of Indigenous self-determination failure continues. So in all senses of the term Indigenous political participation, be it through voting, be it through candidacy representation, or even national body representation, the Indigenous experience is always limited, and it's limited far worse than non-Indigenous democratic experiences. So running alongside this need of First Nation representation and enhanced support of the Australian government for improving First Nation political participation has been this question of Indigenous constitutional recognition. This question has generated a lengthy process that's rolled out in Australia, which started over two decades ago, back in 1999, when Prime Minister, um, the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, endorsed a really weak form of Indigenous constitutional recognition. The form that he proposed was symbolic. It was symbolic words of acknowledgement of Indigenous people's pre-existing custodianship over the land in the preamble of the Australian Constitution. This form of Indigenous constitutional recognition failed because Howard didn't consult with First Nation people, First Nation communities, or even the Australian public really for that matter. So it had no real support. It had no real buy-in, no, no legitimacy. The change would be so minimal, most First Nation people viewed the preambular reform as toothless and that it wouldn't bring about any meaningful change to their daily lives. From the failure of the 1999 referendum, the question of Indigenous constitutional recognition remained on the table. First Nations from there on took up Howard's opportunity for constitutional reform and sought for recognition that would bring about substantive structural reform to our lives and Australian law and policy making culture. However, in 2015, the process that underpins the Recognise campaign put us back a few places. It put us back again by making us confront a government designed and led process that barely consulted with First Nation people and communities yet again. All of us mob lost faith, a lot of faith actually, and trust in the Australian government at that point. Nothing was even really designed and put on the table for people to consent to or deliberate over, and so it crashed and burned pretty quickly. The core of the issue there was that the process was really bad. <laughs> that was until advocates like Professor Megan Davis, Arnie Pat Anderson, Noel Pearson, Senator Patrick Dodson and Kirsty Parker in early 2015 called for the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Abbott, to undertake a proper Indigenous process so that mob could determine where they stood for themselves on the question of their recognition within the Australian Constitution. This was the year the Referendum Council was formed and it was tasked with conducting a series of regional Indigenous only meetings, which would then culminate into a national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander constitutional convention. Those are the regional dialogues. The regional dialogues were held around the country between December 2016 and May 2017, and they considered several possibilities of constitutional amendments to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution. The process of consultation looked very different because it was Indigenous designed and led. Now, because of that, elders led the conversations and only a handful of constitutional pro bono lawyers were allowed to speak and that was only when called upon by elders and only to explain complex technical constitutional reform issues in an easy to understand way. Mob were also empowered to speak in their traditional language and use translators to communicate what they were saying into English and in some instances then translate that further into another Indigenous language so others from other different nations could contribute. This was the first time this has ever occurred in Australia where we had traditional owners, 
and community representatives from far and wide speaking firsthand in their language about what they wanted for their future and what they wanted for their descendants' futures in terms of this type of constitutional, structural, substantive reform. From those deliberations, a consensus emerged around the need for a single form of constitutional recognition, and that was a First Nations voice. Details of how this constitutional amendment was prioritised and what was rejected are all in the final report of the Referendum Council of 2017. But the priorities from each of the First Nation regional dialogues were reported to the First Nations Constitutional Convention at Uluru in 2017. This convention is the 13th dialogue. Now, at the convention, the delegates agreed to a set of 10 guiding principles, which were that any constitutional change Firstly, doesn't diminish Aboriginal sovereignty and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty. It involves substantive structural reform. It advances self-determination and the standards established under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It recognises the status and rights of First Nations. It tells the truth of history. It does not foreclose on future advancement. It does not waste the opportunity of reform. It provides a mechanism for First Nations agreement making. It has the support of First Nations and it does not interfere with positive legal arrangements. Now, the outcome of this was, firstly, a statement of acknowledgement of the place of First Nations as the first peoples of Australia um, was rejected on the, on the basis that it would predominantly be symbolic, minimalistic, and that could undermine claims of sovereignty and be inconsistent with truth-telling. So that would be a preambular reform, just a mere statement of acknowledgement within the preamble of the Australian Constitution. The second um, outcome was that an amendment to the race power, which I'm sure Teela will get into um, given her experience with that. So section 5126 of the constitution was rejected and that power allows the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws with respect to people um, of a particular race. But even though there was concern about this power being used to discriminate adversely against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the proposed amendment to the race power would not necessarily prevent it. Removal of the word race from the race power was not also seen as substantive structural reform. And so it was rejected on the basis that it might waste the opportunity for reform. Plus it might also jeopardize important Commonwealth legislation with respect to cultural heritage protection, land rights and native title. The third outcome was that the insertion of a new provision in the constitution, so to prohibit racial discrimination, that was considered substantive structural reform but given that it created a legal protection or shield, it was seen as less consistent with advancing self-determination and recognition of the unique status and rights of First Nations. So it was rejected on that basis. And another reason it was rejected was that it wouldn't explicitly provide a platform to advance treaty and truth-telling. The Constitutional Convention didn't agree on the detail of the amendment to enshrine a First Nations voice called for in the Uluru Statement. However, there was agreement to its core function. So this proposal, the voice to parliament proposal within the Uluru Statement, can be said to be consistent with the spirit of the Uluru Statement from the heart. And that's because it promotes all of the 10 guiding principles that I went through before. So, for example, it provides recognition of First Nations sovereignty through substantive structural reform that delivers self-determination for First Nations through which they can pursue agreement making, truth telling or other reforms into the future. And so the dialogues called for a voice to parliament to be constitutionally enshrined, sequenced as the first reform um, to occur, and that should take place, you know, as per the Uluru statement and the consensus that was reached and Uluru mandate. Constitutional entrenchment of a First Nations body of this kind, a voice to parliament, would protect it from legislative extinguishment from successive leadership if they so happen to have um, a different position or policy agenda to First Nation political empowerment and self-determination. The voice to parliaments agreed upon function per the mandate from the dialogues and the Uluru Statement is to provide advice to the Commonwealth Parliament on laws and policies that impact upon First Nation affairs. 
and we know that in the past that institution of parliament has made laws and policies that have been entirely to the detriment of First Nation interests to the extent they've been used as a vehicle to dispossess First Nations and eradicate First Nation cultural identity entirely. And even now we still see Commonwealth legislative powers being used that don't work to advance or protect First Nation rights, which clearly require First Nation input. Now, there are important reasons as to why the dialogue leadership sequenced a constitutionally enshrined voice first in the Uluru Statement. Establishing the voice first and constitutionally protecting it would provide First Nations with a body of resources that will benefit us mob when we need to negotiate treaties and their frameworks. Treaties will require resources and it will require the best of the best silks necessary to equal out the bargaining power between First Nation communities and the Australian government. It's a very complex and important process. We're not talking about first contact treaties, we're talking about making modern treaties. And this is in fact where sovereignty can be limited for First Nation people. If it's not done in the right way with the right power and the right resources, Treaties are agreements. There will be lots to compromise on. And already in Victoria, Senator Lydia Thorpe faces these challenges with her advocacy behind treaties. Only three people in the Victorian Parliament voted yes to acknowledge Aboriginal Victorian sovereignty in the Victorian legislative treaty making framework, and the same again for acknowledging Victorian First Nation elders and how they should be recognised within that law as integral parts of the process. Now, this is just for a law to set out the process and already it's been government controlled and limited for Aboriginal Victorians. Those that push for treaty first in this way are actually advocating for limiting our options as First Nation people from the get go and that narrows our future because the structure remains unchanged. Those treaty first advocates are back on a legislative instrument introduced and supported by the race power within the constitution that doesn't change and can't change the sovereign status of the Australian state or have an impact on the deep structural flaws in the relationship that can be abolished at the whim of government. Yet people still accept this treaty first argument, knowing these types of things outright and yet to properly consider why voice first um, why the voice is first and what its function would be and how that places us in a better position for treaty negotiations. The same will be the case for truth-telling processes. Through a voice, we will need to ensure truth-telling processes are self-determined and guided by First Nation people and communities. The voice establishes First Nation political legitimacy, which is going to be necessary to maintain First Nation co control over how treaty and truth-telling legislative frameworks are created. MOB who participated in the dialogues also identified various ways in which we are already doing truth-telling in Australia through various reports, commissions and inquiries. But this is usually done as a one-off exercise with minimal follow-through by the Australian government to address issues that are revealed within those truth-telling processes. And what they felt was, was that without proper First Nation control over those processes through having a voice, truth-telling done in that way would continue to be a can-kicking strategy for the government to pretend it's doing something for First Nation people without affording us any substantive, substantive rights. You don't get substantive rights unless they're constitutionally recognised, and that requires the law and the Australian government to respect them and adhere to them. So the co-design process, um, the phase for the co-design um, phase for the voice has one day left um, for you to all make a submission. Um, the submission round closes tomorrow, which is the 30th of April. Um, and if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to all make a submission. Um, and all the details, instructions to do so um, are on the UllaroosStatement.org website um, under the submissions tab. Uh, we have videos that walk you through the almost 300 page interim voice report. 
Um, the link to the National Indigenous Australian Agency website is also on there as well, and that's where you'll have to upload your submission for it to be counted. Um, and we even have a submission generator on our website. Um, but at this stage, we're encouraging everyone to win the first big part of our battle for this body, and that's its constitutional protection. So this would be the key feature of your submission if you support the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the dialogue leadership. Um, at this point of the campaign, the business end, we have the numbers, we have the support, we're ready to go to a referendum. We just need to now, through making submissions and showing a mass majority Australian support of what the dialogues called for, what the Uluru Statement called for, which was a constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to Parliament, mm -hmm. um, we need to, to basically show that within this submission part of the process um, so that we can encourage and compel government to timetable a referendum. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening to me speak. Yama Uindi Tila, Nirambang Ranging Yagi. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we are here. Hello, I'm Tila. Um, thank you, Uncle. He must have left here who gave us that welcome to country. Um, I must admit, I've probably breached my own rule and those imposed upon me many times um, to be well prepared. And today, I must admit, I am very little prepared, but I do have a presentation I'm trying to get up here. Great. Um, and I, I guess before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, I would like to acknowledge everyone that has showed up here. Um, I've done so many of these presentations now that I really would like to reiterate that when you show up into these spaces, it doesn't mean how big or how small um, the gathering is. Each of them have been so pivotal in getting this nation to the point that we are at now. Um, I would like to particularly acknowledge my old judge, <laughs> Justice McCallum, who I was tip staff for, um, who has come here uh, today and it's interesting because last Friday I was having dinner with Justice Hamill and um, and previously her honour Justice Mary Gordon in Dubbo of all places and each of them also warned me at the time to be prepared and and, <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that um, you know I'll learn one day but please forgive me I have been in the trenches of Newtown local court um, all day and was there appearing until 4.25 p.m. this afternoon. So I'm going to narrow the things I have to say, though, um, to, to three main points, really, so that I don't drag this out too much. But the three points for me tonight are going to be this, just simply my role and my story, which is just a black fella. It's just another black fella in the movement. I can attest to no expertise in this area at all. Um, and so that'll be the first thing, just my story and how I was involved in this journey with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Some people who we visited around the country, I remember one, one Gabba, who we, Gabba is a word in the white, black community we call white fella, and he goes, I don't even know why you don't call it the Uluru Statement from the Fist. That's what I'd be calling it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going to touch on my journey um, a little bit around that. The second thing is I'm going to speak directly to my involvement with the dialogues, um, the, the, the very particular journey that was, um, that underpinned the Uluru Statement that was conceived by um, Professor Megan Davis, an expert in this area. Um, and then the third thing is before I kind of let you all go, um, I'm just gonna briefly outline the legal steps where, where we're at in trying to get this across the line. Because it's not a matter of if, it, it, it absolutely is a matter um, of when in relation to ensuring that the first step that the Uluru Statement calls for, which is enshrining 
of First Nations voice. We know we are close as activists and advocates on the ground um, because even in light of the, the political dismissal um, over the last, it's been, someone reminded me recently, it's been now almost five years since that journey, since uh, our elders and old people met um, at the heart of the nation, at the base of Uluru and gifted that statement to you. That was the invitation to each of you sitting here now and every other Australian person um, to walk with us on this journey. So thank you all for showing up. I know how busy you are. Um, but for me, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, I was born and raised in Gilgandra. Um, I went home on the weekend and, the, and it was a little gathering with my nun and a few old people and they're like, oh, tell everyone who you are and what you do. And I'm like, I'm just another black fella. And they're like, no, nah, not that. It's like, what are you doing in Sydney? None of them have no idea, which I love because, you know, I can go home and it just doesn't matter if I pass, fail or, you know, show up to court or not. Um, so, yeah, in terms of my story, I was born and raised in Gilgandra. A lot of my advocacy and activism has been instilled from me from a very early age. I recall very vividly as, you know, uh, knee high to a grasshopper being dragged off to, to many lands council meetings um, in my community and, and that was the beginning of my land rights journey. Um, those lessons came though, I guess, you know, beyond formal education, it was my grandfather who, who really instilled that upon me. Um, and, and it's been quite the, the little journey to become a lawyer, which is kind of just really the main part of where I have become involved with the Uluru Statement from the Heart, because I trust that many of you here have shown up and you have some history around, um, you know, there are many other petitions in the past, um, but it was at law school where a lot of my thinking had been um, embedded within this idea actually of an Australian Republic. So at law school, I had written a lot about sovereignty, what models I thought an Australian Republic could look like. Um, and that was at the peak of uh, what some of you might remember as the Recognise campaign. It's like the big red R. And at that time, the activism in the black community was really rallying against that particular uh, corporation, essentially, because it was a corporation uh, to set up to push this campaign. That, and I must... <laughs> this is my presentation that is not for level 22. <laughs> Again, my um, lack of uh, preparation. But, look, it does have some things in here that I just want to briefly take you all through so you have a visual of uh, not only the journey of the Uluru Statement but the steps we really need to hone in on in terms of the importance of this legal reform that we will get this nation across the line. Some of you might know Thomas, um, he is an, a fellow campaigner. Him and I did an event together um, and that this is the presentation. I should say I create all the material and he just rocks up as a bush lawyer <laughs> to ride on my coattails. Anyway, so we'll go to the next presentation. Uh, yeah, next one, sorry. And so these are just probably some of the past petitions that each of you are aware of, or if not aware of. I mean, the thing is, the Uluru Statement has become such now a part of our national dialogue and conversations at the coffee table or the dinner table. People understand the Uluru Statement somewhat, generally. But many petitions happened in the past. Danny mentioned one early, which is the top right-hand corner, which is the Curability Statement. I think actually that's probably more pivotal than the Uluru Statement in our nation's journey. That was issued in 2015 from a num number of Aboriginal organisations and leaders who met at Curability House and issued a statement. And if people were listening in 2015, we would have known then that the Uluru Statement was not a surprise at all because this particular statement said we, we reject any symbolism. It, it's already rejected as of 2015. Um, but it called upon a process to include First Nations peoples in this discussion and dialogue about, well, if we're rejecting the symbolism, what form and manner would uh, a reform take and what would be acceptable by First Nations peoples in moving and shifting the nation forward? Um, so 
symbolism was rejected, then we get to the Uluru Statement in 2017, where the substantive constitutional recognition, there's a line drawn in the red sand. There is absolutely a line drawn now that symbolism is 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 a no-go zone, essentially. But you know, we've got the Larry Key petitions. Many of you would know the Baronga Statement, and this is the moment um, with Hawke shaking the hand of one of the leaders um, at Baronga with respect to, you know, this has kind of been such a pivotal image in terms of that promise of a treaty. The promise that this nation would eventually get to a treaty and we know that each promise that the government have ma has made has never come to pass. And that was one of the lessons that many elders had spoken about um, in the dialogues was that we cannot issue any more of our hard work to be hung on the walls of parliament down in leafy Canberra. It needs to go directly to the people. And that's what they did. They issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart directly to the people. And so, and that's Marcia Langdon up there, I think, yeah, with to the left in terms of the Larrakia petition, and I'm not sure, I'm sorry, who the elder is next to her. But this is just kind of just to symbolise that this is, you know, one part of our nation's story. The next slide, um, which gets me to kind of my role in this, which is when we went out in, well, I shouldn't say we actually, because again, my role was very minor, um, but in terms of the constitutional dialogues, I was a working group leader on the head of power. So a lot of my writing in particular around 2016, I had written a chapter in Marcia Langdon and, and Professor Megan Davis's book called It's Our Country. And that was kind of my one chapter that I'd written on the Republic model, which then kind of captured my invitation to be behind um, this process of the Uluru Statement. So at each dialogue, there were five models across the top debated by every elder in the room. And these are the sites down the left where they um, had been done across the community. And it involved a cross-section of the Aboriginal community. And it needed to involve, a cro these dialogues needed to involve a cross-section of the Aboriginal community to ensure that there was a cross-section of input. There is just absolutely no way we can continue this revolving door of consultation. The line is absolutely drawn now in terms of this was the mandate, 60% traditional owners, 20% um, Aboriginal traditional La, Aboriginal leaders, I should say, um, and then 20% organisations. So it was a cross-section of the First Nations community come to the table in relation to these dialogues. And this is what they come up with. It was those discussions at um, the dialogues where, again, it was extremely clear that symbolism was rejected and they were moving more towards uh, substantive constitutional recognition and a voice to parliament was what had ranked the highest among, um, among the groups. Yep. Um, Canberra looks like it had problems. <laughs> it did have problems because that's Ngunnawal country and it was not on the original. Um, so the the framers behind it had a budget, a very small budget of just over a million dollars to traverse the country and, and consult with all First Nations. It was not originally on the site, um, but then it got added on. And there is, if you look at the referendum report, it's more fleshed out in there about the outcomes from there. But yes, it was um, added on in the end. Uh, and I must admit, I'm not sure what their ultimate resolution was in that group, but it will be in the referendum report. Anyone else with questions? All right, we'll go to the next slide, because this is the moment. This is the moment at uh, Uluru in which moments after Professor Megan Davis took to the podium and read the statement for the first time, um, this is a room, you can see, it looks quite joyous and happy, but in fact, if any of you have been in a group of black fellas, of that many, it's not always harmonious, but it was a clear achievement in the sense that it was this consensus building moment that this nation now has to write off this wave. We absolutely can't let any more elders pass from that room because there have been some that have without seeing this nation seriously change and reset its relationship 
with its First Nations. So there are many, many, many elders in that room um, and, and other leaders of the community, but also when the dialogues happened around the country, this was quite similar to what they all look like. Like we'd all go into uh, a room and then we would dismantle, distribute into kind of different rooms in terms of discussing and debating the law, the civics of the changes. So that was a very, very pivotal experience for me because I was still working for Justice Lucy McCallum at the time. And I don't even think I had my practicing certificate. I may have just had it, but I was a working group leader on, on the race power. Um, and it was among many other activists and advocates who were decades beyond my experience. And I think managing that, um, those expectations and the debates in that room um, have been something that has shaped me for the rest of my uh, experiences. And it'll be things I'll never forget, you know. So, for example, one of the things that was discussed around the race power in Section 5126, because I don't have to give you a lesson on that, you all know the outcome of that. But from the First Nations perspective, there are lots of debates around, well, we, there is there's no guarantee of the words we can change. There is no guarantee of how we can amend the race power or not. That was what effectively got amended in 1967. Um, and while on the one hand it has been an achievement, there is no guarantee that the High Court at some point in time, if we proposed changes, that that wouldn't be interpreted in a particular way that was not necessarily intended. So ultimately on the race power um, from my anecdotal experience is that it was way too risky. It was way too risky for the mob to and, and to draft even um, with the expertise of lawyers that were in the room, um, a, a kind of water clad guarantee that it couldn't be interpreted negatively. But that is the, the moment. Um, and that's something that continues to inspire me till this day because I remember sitting at my desk at Legal Aid on the day when um, the news was popping up that it got leaked, that the government had dismissed it. And um, I felt my heart sink. Not for myself, but having gone through the experiences and, you know, from my community to delivering the, uh, the groups on, on the race power, to hear the Prime Minister of the country dismiss our hopes, it wasn't for me, it was for our old people who had fought so hard for those changes. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is, you don't need to know that, but if you've been following the Uluru Statement, it's been quite a journey through political, political dismissal after political dismissal. It honestly has been you guys showing up and having the conversations that has kept this a live political issue. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Oh, and this is, sorry to toot my, sorry to toot my own trumpet, but um, look, that was, I'm not, this is my friend actually, Justice Lisa McCallum's other tip staff. <laughs> we had at the time, <laughs> she liked a particular type. But um, I was. I remember being in the police cells in Manly Local Court, and if any of you have lawyers have been in the police cells of Manly Local Court, it is quite the trail down underground. And I popped up from the cells one day, and I had all these missed calls from Professor Megan Davis. Something, and oh my God, something is not going great because if I've got all these calls from her, um, I'm in trouble, or I'm not in trouble, but something's going to happen. But essentially, my, the bottom line of my story is she's like, okay, tonight. Um, you're going to go on Q&A. And I'm like, I can't. It's Justice Hamill's birthday party and, I think she, and I've got dinner plans. And she's like, no, you're going and then you're going on Q&A. Turns out I rock up to Q&A and ask Malcolm Turnbull a question in terms of his dismissal of the Uluru Statement and the head, this is the headlines the next day. Um, and I'm not sure if the GIF works, but it's a GIF. If you can click it, it might or might not work. Oh, and this is just him trying to mansplain me. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it, was, <laughs> but look, uh, that was 
was one of the moments of this whole journey. And I think it's really important, as someone said earlier, that we keep our humour among this battle as well, not for our own sanity, but for each other's, you know, uh, to keep our energy up. Because this is a fight that is, is not going to end soon. But next slide. Um, uh, Danny spoke about the, the strategy behind. There is a particular strategy behind the statement that is extremely strategic um, and that, you know, again, it's issued to the people, not the politicians. There is a specific sequence we are calling for to ensure the structural changes happen. And you might have noticed there's no official campaign, really. There's a number of things happening. And I think one elder said to me one time, look, <clears throat> That's just how it happens. That's how black fellas have gotten so far, is that we're, we are masters in coalition building. And I think that speaks to the diplomacy of our ancestors in the sense that we wouldn't be here without them. And I think that um, their diplomacy in getting us this far and surviving this far has meant that we don't need to be one official campaign. Um, we have kept this alive on the political agenda um, just by existing and I think that the people are continuing to show up for this people's movement because it is growing and that's just not me saying it, that is consecutive polls um, that have said the people are voting yes above 50% each time even when the politicians say no. So the next step, uh, Denny already touched on the, the um, principles that underpin the dialogues. Uh, we'll go to the next one because I kind of want to finish up on... Uh, we, can have a, we can stop here for a little bit. Um, this has been part of our journey as well. Um, in terms of the statement, although it's retired now uh, with Professor Davis, it, this is part of its journey around the country. This is the greatest photo, I think, of um, Arnie Pat Anderson holding that uh, in the, the statement, the original statement in a Kuhlerman um, with, of course, we know the mega mines next to her. Um, and it has been, you know, as you can see, it, it's just one that continues to be embraced by the people. And I think what I have learned is that Actually, part of the battle is teaching non-Indigenous Australia the, their own system um, <laughs> and, and how it has neglected First Nations peoples along the way and how that contributes to our continual oppression at times. And so part of just what I have been doing in my own time, because, you know, this is, all my, this is out of my obligation for my people that I have done this work. Um, most people don't know that I'm a criminal defence lawyer in those police cells each day. Um, but, yeah, I think that it's really nice to reflect. And this is Rennie Kulitscher, who is the artist behind the artwork. So um, it's really nice, I think, to reflect on how important this journey has been and put a face to some of the amazing people that have been behind it. So we just didn't take no for an answer. And I think if you know me personally and if you know a group of black fellas, we never take no for an answer. And I think we will get this, we, we absolutely will get this reform across the line. I have no doubt about that. Um, so we we'll, can go to the next slide. This was just interesting, I thought. <clears throat> And this is a bit old now, in 2018. I think one has a more updated barometer of Reconciliation Australia has come about. Um, and whether or not, you know, you believe in these polls or whatnot, they're actually probably one of the only things we have to gauge ourselves on apart from public sentiment. Um, it's that each time these concepts or themes or ideas that the Australian people, when they're asked to, to vote on, they keep raising the issue that... It is important that First Nations peoples have a voice. It is important to resetting the relationship and that truth-telling is absolutely something that this nation needs to do. Not a matter of when, but it needs to happen. So there are just some statistics from Reconciliation Australia. Um, the next part. and um, So this is kind of where I want to leave you guys at. Um, because you're all lawyers and you all probably know the law better than me. So um, the thing where we're at now, and Danny has articulated it quite well in terms of this, the context and that we're, we're at a point of submissions. Um, and this is kind of the second inquiry from my memory post the dismissal because we've had one uh, which had to do with 
a, bi a multi-party kind of inquiry about what model to put on the table and it basically said it keeps saying the voice is the only model but politicians keep dragging us through you know the bureaucracy to keep proving the same point um but in terms of getting this across the line uh and the process who hand up if you've all lived through a referendum before i've never voted in one so these guys at the back would never have either. So this is all kind of, it's a clever side, yeah. So the ultimate aim though of this voice getting across the line is that we're kind of coming to a very big crossroads in terms of, as Denny said, there's this co-design happening. Um, we know the voice is the only model on the table. Some people are asking, what does the voice look like? We know as lawyers, you don't enshrine the model um, into the constitution, but we're kind of coming to a peak now in trying to give enough information about what that might do, say, look like by legislation. Um, and I should iterate that the co-design model led by Minister Wyatt is not backed by activists and campaigners um, because it threatens to diminish the mandate of the Uluru Statement in the sense that it's threatening to uh, legislate the voice and not enshrine it. So we're coming to a peak at the moment where there's this uh, design process happening um, and activists are holding the line on the constitutional reform of it. And we're slowly getting to a point where um, essentially as activists, we've always said that the constitutional deferral of, of the model has to to happen so you can have it there you can put it to a voter they can look at the legislation but it must not be set up until we get past the referendum and there is a time period I think I put the time period maybe um, yeah it's like essentially uh, essentially it's this once you have the bill you've got six months to put the question to the people um, and this is one so we can leave this here actually I'll leave it with this when we had the first inquiry um, about inquiring into constitutional recognition and the model, which is post Uluru, after Turnbull had dismissed it, he'd set up this, this inquiry. In this inquiry, it was experts who had submitted this in one of their submissions, which was, so some, a lot of people go, what's it gonna look like? What's the legislation? They, they had um, identified this, as the words to be inserted, not the model, but the words to be inserted into the constitution as section 129. Um, and that, that was based on a number of uh, research on previous questions in Australia. Like, you know, you, it has to be, obviously, obviously we all know how we'd really screwed up the referendum on the Republic because the question was so um, ambiguous and it was bound to fail. Um, but this is what they are proposing we go to. So the work, the work is being done. The work has been done and it's led by experts um, on this. And the experts are from UNSW Law, um, led by Professor Megan Davis, who have said and reiterated this is the way we enshrine it. Um, go go do your model, design the legislation, but let's get to that crossroads when we ensure that rather than setting it up, um, this is how we get the constitutional recognition across the line. Um, the next one, does anyone have any questions on that? If you do, actually, I probably wouldn't know the answer. Because <laughs> they're probably, so, uh, yeah. That's a question, but do you want to speak to the yeah. controversy about that, the third, yeah, about about that the structure should be reserved to huh? yeah. parliament or and one of the criticisms, early criticisms, yes. was, no, you need to present the structure because otherwise people won't approve it. And that's been a very strong part of your campaign to reduce yeah. that. So. Yes, it has. You're right. So do you mean the controversy in terms of a black colour point of view? or? Well, uh, well, I think I've just heard from many quarters that, that debate about people saying you need to present the structure and the Uluru Statement for activists saying no, we, we just want to get this through as the idea or the principle and then leave it to Parliament to set the structure. Yeah, well, I guess the one thing with respect to the voice is it's going to look different in different communities, which is why it needs to have some flexibility around it. 
I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, though, in relation to... I just remember um, Arthur Moses speaking yes. at that symposium yeah. that we had, and yeah. he was saying this will never get across the line if you don't give it a structure from the outset because people will be sceptical. Yeah. And I think it's just been a very strong part of your campaign to say... Well, we can't. Yeah. We just can't give it a structure because if we try to do that, we'll never even get it to a referendum. Yeah. And just that, so that deliberate um, high-level principle statement is what's being propounded. But they are attempting... So, go, well, what, yeah. what does it look like? And I think it's important for people to understand that that's a necessary way to present it from your point of view. Yes. And the thing is, uh, they... I don't know if I'm able to answer your question, but, um, yeah, Daddy, you go. So basically what you're talking about is the Joint Select Committee on um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Constitutional Recognition, which was chaired by Senator Patrick Dodson and Julia Lisa, and they came out with um, their final report of that Joint Select Committee in 2018, and recommendation one of that report to which the interim voice report that was issued from Ken White and his three appointed advisory groups. It draws upon recommendation one of that joint select committee report where they say it's important to enter now into a co-design process of the voice and in doing so what you're doing, which is what you're saying, you're putting meat on the bones for potential design options of what the voice could look like, how it would function, how membership would work. Uh, so that Australians are better enabled to have a better understanding of what they're actually voting on once it's put to a referendum. Um, and so the interim voice report draws upon the Joint Select Committee's re recommendation and they usually term it as the Dodson and Lisa report. Um, but what it fails to do is recognise as part of that recommendation it was about put meat on the bones first prior to timetabling a referendum and then enshrine the voice to protect it. Um, and that's an issue because not only that is that the mandate from the Uluru Statement from the Heart, but the interim voice report that comes up with all the options um, of how the voice could function actually leaves out of its terms of reference the constitutional enshrinement, which is an integral part of designing the legal form of the voice. Mm -hmm. And so what you're seeing now is they've... Um, narrowed the scope for public debate and consent on this particular body because you're unable to go to the extent of design of its entrenchment. But we've always also, we've all, always made the concession there does need to be some detail. We've yeah. always had the concession that, we've always had to concede the point that if we're going to get to a referendum, so in the um, the the papers you get as a yes, no vote. And we've also conceded that there's probably going to be a no case in Australia. Um, at the, there was a no, there was not a no case in 1967, but we have conceded there's probably going to have to be more detail than we liked at the beginning of our campaign. And that what we are trying to hinge, though, our advocacy on is that if there is going to be some, you know, point three, which is around the the reservation that of Parliament to retain the power to make it how it wants to, that there has to still be input and that that input has to be flexible because, for example, if you, you go to Yongul country, the way they elect their leaders and their speakers is very different to how you do it down here south in New South Wales. So, for example, we're very used to the ballot box down here. We're very used to, through our Lands Council systems, voting and stuff. That's not how it happens in the Northern Territory or South Australia. They have their own systems in place. So we're saying, yep, we can see there's a point in terms of detail, but we want flexibility as well. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about the practical side, which is really a post-referendum point. Yeah. Which is, if a clause is inserted in this, in this way or this form into the Constitution, it is still, of course, and Danny, feel free to jump in because you're far more of an expert on this than I am, but it would still be in, in, interpreted based on all of these discussions and the dialogue leading up to the Ulleri Statement in, in the first place. But I appreciate that doesn't answer the referendum question. No. So, litigation question for lawyers to the, the question is still very live as to, for example, the question is still very live about 
Is it the entire pieces of legislation when we get to the question of a referendum? Is that everything that goes to the people or not? Like, those details are still being really, I guess, debated. And the detail of what we put to the reasonable voter, the lay person, is a very live issue still. If, if it, Not that it's our, in our power, but, you know, that's still a live thing. Yeah. I understand the rationale for not wanting to get bogged down in detail prior to the Yes. I also understand that getting across the hurdle or over the hurdle of a referendum is much, much higher than getting an ordinary bill through Parliament. But my question, I guess, is if there's a concern about, uh, and, and if there's concern about political consensus at this point, about what does a voice look like, and that is part of the motivation for not getting into that issue in such detail now, why do we feel that there will be sufficient political consensus in one way or another once the referendum's passed? Like, what happens if we pass this referendum and the next day after the party, no one agrees on what exactly an Indigenous voice, or a First Nations voice, I should say, looks like? Well, it's passed and it still has to be established. And, and, and the... And, and, yeah. And you get a 49-51 vote. And, it, and it's Parliament, not just so I that. I understand that the way it would work is the referendum goes through and then the Parliament of the day yes. um, passes legislation to put the structure in place. But the yes. of the passage of the referendum change, they have to do that having regard to the First Nations voice. Yes, but, yes. So they're not bound to apply. But that could cover... But, but, that can cover anything from a suggestions box in Parliament House that's to be utilised by First Nations people up to and including specific seats within Parliament for First Nations people. Well, so your interpretation by reference to dialogue of the regular. No, no, you go. So, so I guess that, I mean, given that there's such a broad spectrum that of potential legislative outcomes to give effect to this referendum once it's passed, how do we actually sort of ensure that what we get is some actual substance at the end of the day from so the high courts for mm. <laughs> well, there's a few issues. So the body's not meant to be. It's a non-justiciable body. So that was when the, within the interim voice report. There's also no... Um, so there's no legal obligation for ministers within parliament and government to... Um, that are, in terms of the wording that it uses within the report, like an obligation to consult with voice members, um, and an expectation of voice members to be consulted with if there's um, utilisation of what the report terms as like a trigger reason, a clearly identified um, explicit reason to create a law that will directly or indirectly impact First Nations and therefore you would consult with the voice, which is really difficult because that means that there's a really weak form of accountability in terms of the voice's functions. Um, but part of the Uluru Dialogue mandate was for the voice to have an ability to speak to both chambers of parliament, so to speak to the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, what you see in the options of the interim voice report are um, through, you know, the scrutiny committees within parliament, through tabling advice, which would go on public record if ministers have not consulted with the voice. Um, but the types of like the length of those types of processes and the quick turnaround expectation of having to consult with ministers on various different laws in the very early making stages as well, mind you. Yeah, but also, you know, Australia is not unaccustomed to a First Nations voice. It has, we've had many models in the past. It's not going to be like it's just going to grow and black fellas are going to go take over parliament. I mean, we are extremely accustomed to the way in which First Nations execute their voice is in this democracy. It's the, the issue isn't that, you know, it's not reasonable. The issue is that each time it gets loud, each time it gets powerful, it gets, you know, struck off by, by government. So it's not really a question of the model as much as it is a question of the reform. And this is such an important discussion because I've never really had people engage with it like this. But as much as it is an important reform and legal question, this is a moral question like for the country that we need to grapple with. And the fact that we have over 250 First Nations in this country and each of them have to have a voice and whatever that looks like is not always up to the government. It, that's what I'm saying. It's going to look different in different nations. I mean, what's really interesting about your proposal is that the limitation is in the second uh, provision. 
So you absolutely identify that all you want is a voice. Yes. You say it is views. You say you're not voting, you're not interfering with that. It is a view. Yep. That limitation then means that three, and your decision not to have that much detail, three doesn't really matter that much. Like That's ultimately, the limitation that you want to assure the Australian community that it's saleable, which is we're not going to fundamentally change your democracy, we just want a voice within yes. there to be able to take The guarantee it. that it's there. Um, really, three, the detail of it, um, I must admit, sitting here, I go, well, what does it really matter? Like, And if it is just, you know, you get to put something in a suggestion box, well, if that's as badly as it's implemented, you can take the next step. But, I mean, it seems to me that you have got a beautiful, great respect, a beautiful proposal, because how can, as you say morally... How can it be yeah, wrong yeah. to say the First Nations people should be able to speak directly to Parliament? You're not saying you're going to no. change the vote. You're not saying you're going to change We just the want to be heard, just, essentially. We'd just like to tell you a few things every now and yeah. again about us. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think it's a beautifully designed proposal. It's also a part of, like, shifting the political culture within Parliament as well, and that's the, like, consciousness of ministers that are in charge of making laws and policies, um, particularly ones that... Um, impact upon First Nation affairs. And what you achieve through the referendum is, yes, not just certainty and stability of the voice and guaranteed protection, but you get public buy-in from going through that process of saying, I'm actually not just going to say I support this. I have to go to a ballot box and I have to vote yes on this. Yeah. And so what you, it creates is its political legitimacy and standing, which, whilst it seems on the face of it, the accountability mechanisms... Um, that I think it calls a transparency mechanisms within the report are quite weak. What you get, though, is through that public buy-in and a successful referendum, greater standing and value and a shift in consciousness of political ministers within Parliament of taking into account this voice and its standing and its credibility. Um, and that's something that doesn't necessarily get considered with all the different political debate that's going on and the scrutinisation of all the different options put forth of the voice in a sort of legal way. It's that also, like, shifting of consciousness and political culture within Australia to better include and... Um, and create space and voice for First Nations. And I think the bigger point that I heard around the country from MOB is this. They want accountability in area of Indigenous affairs. There is zero accountability. And two examples I'll give you that was echoed everywhere I've gone to in particular dialogues is, and many of you would have heard this, close the gap is one example that MOB said we want to continue, we, we ought to continually have a voice on this. And the other one is you may not know much about it's the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. It's like a pool of money um, in which is tagged as government money for Aboriginal communities. And this is, we're talking millions. And, you know, you hear, oh, Aboriginal people get all this money, but if you break it down and if you read the reports, it's going to non-Aboriginal organisations. So those were two things that MOB wanted this voice to have a function and a say in. They're not the only things, but they're very two clear examples of um, what I have witnessed around the country, people saying they want their voices from their communities heard when it comes. If you're going to talk about close the gap, if you're going to talk about... in Indigenous incarceration, these, this is what our community has prioritised. So that's just two examples. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry you did. I'm so sorry. That's OK. Um, I just wanted to um, ask, with Proposal 3, I can understand... It's like I... a lawyer's fest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I, I was going to say, I can understand why you don't want to put a structure in there because, you know, for one, you've got to be flexible and, and not lock things in. But is there a concern in terms of... Says the Parliament shall, subject to the Constitution, have the power to make laws with respect to the composition, etc. Um, so that um, you know, presupposes that there won't be a structure in place when the Parliament does that. So, is there a concern that um, you know that initial stage won't be consultative or sufficiently consultative? Well. I guess that's the kind of crossroads we're coming to. So lots of there there have been many local dialogue conversations led by UNSW Law and the experts there that people don't know about beyond the co-design process. So lots of people in different communities, and I can't speak for them, have their own ideas about what their, their voice looks like. In terms of the level of detail again, um, that, that's a can do you want to speak to the level of detail? It's actually all changed too. We had a mm. drafting workshop yesterday with Yesterday. <laughs> 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 we, had, we had a political sort of 
re-strategization on the wording, different types of models for different types of ways in which we'd play it politically. Um, but I think the biggest thing is some people, want, like there's, there's all different kind of um, views on this, um, but I think, look, ultimately, no matter how you sort of word it, because it's going to be really basic and it's going to be understandable to be strong. It's an enabling provision. It's just going to be an enabling it's provision. It's going to guarantee, like, total minimal risk um, of, like, you know, it's never going to guarantee ministers respecting it or wanting to consult with it. And, you know, and that's kind of, I suppose, probably more greater emphasis on why it needs to be put to a referendum. Um, I think going through that process is, like, really, really integral for all these things that are like sort of weak components of accountability, scrutinisation of ministerial responsibility. Um, in base, And it's basically just principles of good governance, like good governance practice in this is a law that affects a particular group of constituents and I should probably go out and consult and be better informed before I pass this through this law through Parliament. Um, but I think... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I think, look, I'll try and end it here because I have taken up way too much time, but I'll say this in terms of uh, my summary of where we're at, is the whole point of our activism and advocacy has been to provide an enabling provision into the Constitution to ensure that that's guaranteed. What that looks like is a matter for the First Nations um, and that this is absolutely beyond time we just get this business done. I think that, you know, one of the frustrating parts for me as an activist has been blackfellas having to justify why they, they ought to have a voice. And my response has been, you know, often um, this, well, in reality, this is about improving our democratic processes. This is about improving political participation by those that are most marginalised on this continent. And it is a complex question legally and morally. And, you know, I can't express how much work we have done behind the scenes, not me, but, you know, I've witnessed it. Um, and, and I think that we can each leave tonight knowing that we are each on a journey to, to getting us to that referendum and those that haven't voted in one yet will. And this will be the first one. So thanks. <laughs> everyone. Uh, my name's Janet McDonald. I'm a barrister here at Level 22. Unfortunately, uh, Michael Green, the leader of our floor, had to depart because his mother is unwell. Um, so he asked me to um, thank Dr uh, Danny Larkin and Tila Reid for their wonderful presentation here this evening. Can I say, sitting here listening to it, it just saddens me no end that you have to work this hard to ask to be heard. It just... I get... <laughs> I well up, frankly, and I get angry. And um, I thank you so much for your patience, but particularly with a, a group of lawyers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> certainly, uh, just generally, the, the patience of your people over 200 years um, plus years has, is, is extraordinary. Um, so I wish you and all of us the, the best in this journey. Um, so thank you very, very much indeed for coming and speaking to us here tonight. Um, I think we have some uh, flowers to present to you. Get the other one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.